Steve Accord, the Falchero of Galair, Belfield Quega. Ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to the launch of Belfield 50. Today we'll hear from Professor Orla Feely, Vice President for Research, Innovation and Impact and project sponsor of this very special celebration. We're going to share a short movie, Shaping Belfield, and you'll hear from Dr. Ellen Rowley on the timeline exhibition that takes us from 1970 to today. I'll be joined by Daniel Holfield, the photographer, to share with you this very special exhibition of photography which is on view in the campus. And finally, Dr. Ellen Rowley and Professor Fanula O'Kane Cribbins will talk about their wonderful book, Making Belfield. Reading from the report of the President from 1970, it says, on Tuesday, the 29th of September, 1970, Mr. Eamon de Valera, Uchtaran Neheran, declared open the new building for the Faculties of Arts, Commerce and Law and the new restaurant. And the president of the university, Jeremiah J. Hogan, spoke as follows. The opening of this new building is a capital occasion for the history of University College. We shall now have between seven and 8,000 students here at Belfield, while about 3,000 remain at our various older centres. The greater part of the college will be here, and it is a matter of time until all is here. Universities have many difficult problems at this time, but it may be said today that University College Dublin, with the means provided by the Irish government and people, has made great strides towards the solution of one problem which was very urgent in our case, that of space in which to live and do our work. I would now like to invite the President of UCD today, Professor Andrew Deeks, to take up the story. On behalf of the University College Dublin, I am delighted to extend a warm welcome to you this evening as we celebrate the launch of the Belfield 50 project, celebrating the making and shaping of the campus we enjoy today. Shortly after my predecessor, Dr. Michael Tierney, commenced his term of office in 1947, he made one of the most important decisions in our history that UCD would move from its location in Earlsfoot Terrace in the city centre to a suburban site worthy of the university. Great credit must go to him for this extraordinary foresight and brilliant strategy in quietly buying up throughout the 1940s and 1950s, the various estates and tracts of land which now make up our Belfield campus. He credits this as his greatest achievement across his 17 years as UCD president. He foresaw the enormous growth in student numbers and the need to move to a much larger site to provide adequate buildings for the university's ambitious plans. In his own words, when that is done, it will be a worthy university for the people of Ireland. My own first visit to Belfield was in the spring of 2013. Although a number of projects were still under construction at that time, the campus made a very strong impression on me. At its best on a sunny spring day, the scale of the campus, the way the buildings worked with the landscape, the combination of history and modernity and the architectural quality of the most recent buildings melded together to project a world-class university with ambition and drive. During my time as president, I have escorted many guests on tours of Belfield and have enjoyed watching their jaws drop in surprise as they see just how wonderful it is, this hidden gem of ours. I've also talked to many of our senior alumni who reflect on how far the Belfield campus has come since the early days and how well the campus is looking now. We chose 1970 as a commemorative date for the campus since it marks 50 years from the opening of the Newman and Tierney buildings and the relocation of the administration and faculties of Arts, Law and Commerce from Earlsford Terrace to Belfield, 
University College Dublin is dynamic and ambitious. Since its foundation, the university has played a pivotal role in educating Irish and increasingly international students who come to us to experience a holistic education that goes beyond the classroom and the lecture theatre, onto the playing pitches and the debating chamber, and further afield into societies, projects and friendships. The next 50 years will see further evolution and transformation of the local and global societies in which we live and work. I see our campus and our community continuing to evolve and transform, rising to the challenge of societal and cultural changes. One of the enablers of the university's strategy to 2024 is to build world-class academic facilities and student amenities. We have more students and employees at UCD now than ever before. We must plan and implement additional academic spaces, sports and student amenities, and student accommodation for the increased student numbers we expect in the future. We have developed a Strategic Campus Development Plan 2016-2021-2026, which defines three distinct character areas of the campus. Academic, housing our teaching, learning, research and innovation activities. Sports and student amenities, housing our sports pitches and halls, our student centre and our student clubs and societies. And residential, containing our student residences together with retail spaces, dining facilities, meeting rooms and support facilities in a village centre. We will ensure that our campus development supports the delivery of a student experience that defines international best practice and that our strategic themes inform the development of an accessible, sustainable, healthy and digitally enabled campus that also represents international best practice. An exciting part of our plan is the Stephen Hole Future Campus Master Plan, which in Phase 1 will deliver an iconic centre for creativity and a centre for future learning. The UCD Centre for Creativity will be one of the most exciting pieces of modern architecture in Ireland and indeed in the world, making it a fitting frontispiece for the fabulous campus that is Belfield. In this way, we continue and expand on the vision of Dr Tierney to make UCD a campus worthy of the people of Ireland and the world. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to wish the project team the very best with the various components of Belfield 50. I look forward to joining in the celebrations and hope that you will join us over the coming year in some of these events. As project sponsor for the Belfield 50 project, I'm delighted to be able to tell you a little bit about the origins of the project and what we're going to be doing over the course of the next year. This project grew out of another UCD project, our work on the Decade of Centenaries. And at one of our meetings there, a colleague pointed out that September 2020 would see the 50th anniversary of the opening of the what is now the Newman Building in Belfield and the time when really Belfield became UCD's main campus. So we thought that this was a story worth celebrating and so we set about seeing how we would do that. We did so with the guidance of a steering committee of academics from across the university, whom I'd like to thank very much, and the outstanding working group of Ailish O'Brien, Mary Staunton and Ellen Rowley, working with myself, to map out how we would celebrate this event. Now, of course, there was plenty of activity on the Belfield campus before September 1970. The Science Building had been opened a number of years previously and other activities of the university had been taking place here for many years. But it was in September 1970, in Theatre L, when Eamon de Valera, who was then Chancellor of the National University of Ireland, when he opened this building, this was the inauguration of the Vehurst Master Plan for the campus. This was when Belfield became UCD's main campus. And you can see that it was actually more than that. It was a new vision for Irish higher education this large, new, ambitious suburban campus uh, for which buses were rerouted and student communities grew up in South Dublin. So this was something very new for Ireland at this time. 
And when you see some of the photographs of Belfield at the time, these gleaming white buildings, you can get the sense of something very special happening in Irish higher education. So we wanted to capture that sense to look at where we have come from as a university and where we are now going to look at all that has happened on our wonderful campus in the 50 years that have intervened. Now we had a whole range of really exciting uh, activities planned as part of our Bel Belfield 50 celebration that would have seen large numbers of our alumni get together with us on our campus to celebrate our wonderful campus. Unfortunately, we can't now undertake too many of those due to the pandemic. So we've had to think about how we might do things in a different way that will still celebrate our campus, celebrate our alumni and still engage people with our story. So some of the things that we're doing, um, we had planned to have a wonderful exhibition detailing the campus and its architectural history. And our architecture students had done this really wonderful exhibition for us. We can't be bring people in now for an exhibition. So what we're doing is literally pivoting this exhibition so that it will now be facing out of the windows uh, in the basement of the restaurant. So over the coming weeks in early October, we're going to be putting in the timeline of the Belfield campus facing out of the windows in the basement of the restaurant. So we hope that people who are on the campus to work or to study or who come here for their Sunday morning walks, that they will drop by and follow this part of the exhibition. Nearby that, outside the Tierney building, there's a phot photographic exhibition. Really wonderful photographs capturing the wonderful geometries of Belfield. We also, of course, have our website, ucd.ie slash Belfield 50, and there'll be content added there over the course of the year. So please continue to check it out. You'll see a timeline there. You'll see a video of the architecture of the Belfield campus. And later in the year, you'll see the 50 Voices film where we have a number of our Belfield alumni talk about their time on the campus and how it has shaped their journeys. Later in the year, we'll also be introducing walking tours of Belfield with audio descriptions of the buildings. One of the really special parts, and I mentioned Ellen Rowley earlier, is this wonderful book, Making Belfield, Space and Place at UCD, edited by Finola O'Kane and Ellen Rowley. Really fascinating material that Ellen, Finola and their contributors have pulled together in a really exciting scholarly presentation of the architecture of the campus, the vision behind it and some of the broader context, which I think is very thought provoking. So it's a, a beautiful production, a characteristically beautiful production by UCD Press. Uh, for those of us who know and love this campus so well, I, th I think that it's enormously exciting to understand more about the campus and to see it laid out so beautifully and, and with such scholarly insight. So the book is from UCD Press and it's a really, really great volume, really important part of our celebration. So I hope that all like me who, uh, who have been so influenced by this campus will participate in our celebration and engage with it at a remove because of the pandemic, but I don't think that need weaken the strength of the interaction that we can have. So I hope that Belfield 50 and the resources that we have developed will be really interesting and engaging for all those like me who have had their lives shaped by this campus. I still remember so clearly as a 16 year old cycling out to Belfield on my orientation day in UCD. I had to cycle with a friend because I didn't know where Belfield was and that still amazes me that you could have something of this significance 20 minutes away from Terran Yor where I grew up and that I didn't even know where it was. So for me, this campus is a jewel. When I look at all the architecture and how it has evolved over time, how the landscaping has evolved over time, how the work conducted here has evolved over time, when I look at the people who've been shaped by the campus and their journeys over that time, it's a remarkable story of a campus within a city, within a country, within a broader world. I think the story of Belfield 50 is an enormously exciting one and I hope that you will join us in celebrating it. Belfield was just emerging out of the ground when we were there. My primary memory of it was almost like the steppes of Russia. You know, it was open, windy, wet. I thought that this desolate rather lonely um, and rather exciting area as well was where I was going to find my education. They said we were moving out into the middle of nowhere. I just remember vividly uh, walking into this vast space. I suppose the, uh, the physical experience of that were really, really intense. 
beauty of the new buildings more than compensated for any hardship that we had. I mean, it was another world altogether. We all have an opinion about Belfield as a place of learning, but few of us are aware as we dodge the rain under the walkways or hike from Roebuck to Richview that in the early 1970s, UCD Belfield was the realisation of a utopian vision for a modern Irish university. Its design came out of a high profile international competition and two of the original structures were awarded gold medals for design excellence. Belfield was Ireland's first purpose-built modern campus. It fundamentally changed our idea of what a university should look like. I think we have to think of the Belfield campus in the context of what was happening in Irish society at the time from the end of the 1950s onwards. This was a moment when Ireland was beginning to look outwards, to be, become more international in its outlook. From having been relatively insular, it was now wanting to take its place on the world stage. And really we have to think about the campus as exemplifying that new spirit in Ireland. The campus was going to be a, a decisive break really from the models of what a university would have looked like up until that point. It was going to be something new, bold, innovative, international. For much of the early 20th century, UCD's campus was scattered through Dublin's south inner city, from St Stephen's Green to Earlsford Terrace to Marion Street. Student numbers grew rapidly from the 1940s onwards and before long these college buildings became overcrowded. By the 1960s the university was at crisis point. There are 10,000 students in a college that was built for 4,000. This means that there literally aren't enough rooms to go around and lectures have to be given during lunchtime. Advice and criticism of the students work often has to be done in the corridors and library facilities are totally inadequate. When Michael Tierney took up office as UCD president in November 1947, having concluded that any further attempt to expand Earlsford Terrace was unrealistic, he began purchasing a number of villas and 200 acres in the neighbourhood of Belfield and soon moved his family into White Oaks, a new university lodge. The pull of fresh air and green fields was also drawing housing development, schools and other organisations out from Dublin city centre. This was the dawn of the suburban campus and the general spirit of the age was all for a suburban turn. In spite of the many dissenting voices who wished UCD to remain in Dublin city centre, confirmation came that the university was leaving town with the 1960 finance bill. I, I see it de developing greatly in its new site where there's plenty of room. I, I hope to see uh, all the faculties move out and to see student amenities and uh, residential accommodation and everything that's needed in a modern university provided out on the new site. I think when that is done it will be a worthy university for the people of Ireland. The first new Belfield buildings were rapidly under construction. The block consists of the chemistry, physics, botany, zoology and geology departments. And this science block as a whole will now be able to house proper facilities for research and teaching, which have for so long been lacking in the old buildings at Merrion Square. While the science buildings were still being built, the university launched an international architectural competition. By launching this competition, UCD was really making a statement. It was saying, we want the best thinking in architecture that's out there internationally. We want the most radical, the most current, the most avant-garde. A design by a Polish architect, Andrzej Westchert, recently won an international competition for a new university at Stilogan near Donnybrook. Well, he's an amazing person, really. He, he's a, a Polish architect and he decided to do this competition and he did it on the kitchen table and he'd never been to Ireland, and he entered and he won. The buildings will take some time to put up and will then include buildings for each of the main faculties as well as administration. One of the characteristics of Vacher's plan that I think contributed to its winning the competition was its incompleteness, actually. Its capacity 
to take on more and more uh, development over time. And the way that it did that was to orient itself around a sort of central spine of circulation. So it was organized around an idea of movement, movement along these covered walkways. The walkways made a line like a spine cutting through the campus, joining buildings, creating space for students and staff to overlap, to cross paths. Importantly, people and buildings were at the centre while cars were pushed to the outside. Working with established Irish practice Robinson Keefe and Devan Architects, the design evolved. With fellow architect Randall MacDonald, Vehert worked out the best concrete and glazing systems. And so, crushed Wicklow granite was used, along with white quartzite aggregate for the prefabricated panels, while structure and span came from the modular waffle slab, uniting inside without, uniting big space with small. By 1969, Belfield was finally taking shape. The Newman building was almost complete and students from Commerce joined the scientists on campus. The lake quickly became a focal point. Some remember Rag Week swimming, powering model boats and even sailing themselves upon the lake. By 1972, with the construction of Weyhert's extraordinary water tower, Belfield made a vertical mark on the surrounding skyline. You know, it's one pour. You start at the ground with that skinny column and you keep pouring and pouring and pouring and you, you go the whole way up. There's no chance. It's technologically, you know, out of this world. In the water tower, you see Vehart letting rip with what he's really interested in. But of course, there were teething problems for transport and campus access. And there were unfinished facilities like the main library, arguably the intellectual and physical hub of Belfield, which wasn't open until 1973. The development of Belfield has been ongoing. After all, unpredictable growth was the premise of Weyhert's master plan. From the beginning, much of what was designed and built was by other architects, who brought different styles and priorities to bear and many UCD alumni have contributed designs to this eclectic campus, including those for the O'Reilly Hall, set like a temple on the main lake, which gave Belfield its ceremonial space, and the growing portfolio of research centres, the small Urban Institute, and the National Virus Reference Labs, both in the original design and in the subsequent extension. Meanwhile, as student numbers grow, so does Belfield campus. With 133 hectares, it has a life pulse of its own. Woodland walks, playing pitches, lakes and gardens are the lungs to the academic and research brain, while residences and student amenities aim to provide the heartbeat. So the future campus is an architectural plan which is really the start of the next phase of the university's development. It consists of two buildings which span between the original core of the university and its main entrance. Close to the original core, you've got the Centre for Future Learning. And then out at the entrance, you've got the Centre for Creativity, a landmark building. So this really, this new building is intended to announce UCD's presence out at its edge, really for the first time. Others now need to reflect on the original campus architecture and the intentions of its designers. Andre Weyhert and architects like Robin Walker worked tirelessly with UCD officials to make and shape Belfield. And in so doing, they honoured the original university vision of Cardinal Saint John Henry Newman. It is a place which wins the admiration of the young by its celebrity, kindles the affections of the middle-aged by its beauty, and rivets the fidelity of the old by its associations.
So for me, the challenge in, uh, in curating Belfield 50, I understood that or took that as an invitation for the wider communi community in UCD to learn more about the place, how it came to be, and to think about the environment in which, the designed environment in which we, we move, we teach, we learn, we work every day. On the one hand, it's about paying attention to the environment around us, but secondly, drilling down and trying to understand where it came from. So as an architectural historian, uh, I thought about, um, well, how will we go about this? Uh, we should set about making a book, um, set about making a film or two, perhaps some kind of sound experience that would help us walk through the campus. Um, and then, of course, an exhibition. Um, and as a historian, I'm interested in chronologies and I'm interested in origins and legacies. So while I wanted to think about the beginning of things and what was happening in the city centre to move UCD out to this site, I was also, so thus the timeline is something really important. I was also thinking that this kind of paying attention is also like a call to attention and it will help us, we'll learn more about ourselves, will help us to plan better. It, it was clear to me immediately upon this challenge that I had to turn to my own experience and as a teacher my natural inclination was to bring the questions and to bring the curiosity to the students and actually through a series of modules through 2019 and through the start of 2020 um, I worked with students to encounter what was going on in the archives, what archive collections we hadn't seen before and also to investigate the site and to walk to walk, talk, draw, photograph. And so through the students' eyes and the students' work, I actually learned a huge amount. Um, and then that coupled with uh, working as, as long as we could within, within the archive, we, we began to, to piece together all the different players and architects and officials and commissioners who were involved in the making of this pretty extensive campus, let's be honest. Um, and it's interesting actually that that relationship with the students didn't end because then some of them continued into their final year and wrote dissertations about the Belfield campus. One wrote about the water tower, one about the science building and one about the restaurant building. And I'm working and we are working as a team with one of those students who just graduated a few weeks ago, um, Ashley Mulligan. And in terms of the design, uh, the graphic design expertise that she gained during her degree as an arch architecture student. So she's been designing um, and researching and writing the timeline exhibition, which we can see here today, which starts as a kind of a prelude investigation of the 1930s and then begins in earnest wrapping itself around the windows, the, glazing, the glazed walls of the restaurant building, we move from the 1960s through to 2020, through this beautiful dynamic design, um, which follows loosely the plan of the Newman building as a series of blocks. So that's referenced in that design. Interestingly, as well as working from a historical perspective, with history, with the architects as a, on a kind of a history and a site investigation project. I also worked with a colleague, Tiago Faria, in the School of Architecture and uh, within the College of Architecture and Engineering because we worked with engineers and architects to design and build and install um, an exhibition within the basement of the restaurant. Unfortunately, some of, some of that endeavour was cut short by COVID, but it was an amazing learning experience. So the fact that this curatorial project could be really about learning was really, really important for us as a team in terms of Professor Orla Feely and as well the Director of Communications and myself as, a, as an academic in the School of Architecture. So there are, I suppose, three or four main components to this, um, this project, Belfield 50. But as an architectural historian and as we were recording um, around the buildings, their origins, their legacies, their development, where we go from here, buildings become the central theme of the story, but really in how they enable college life to happen as framers, as backdrops for college life. So it's buildings as a central thread to kind of keep us steady, but it's really obviously the people and those involved in life in Belfield. Um, the main output is the book M Making Belfield, which, which drills down as well as going wide and has all sorts of lovely, lovely, colourful uh, stories and, 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 and images within it. Um, and then we also, that, that overlaps, I suppose, as a scene, we continue the, the central thread of buildings within the timeline. So, so that, that buildings and their, their origin, their making, 
keep us steady and then we tack, they're like hooks onto which we hang the histories of the university and the timeline. Um, and the film that we're seeing today as part of this launch, Shaping Val Belfield, is similarly a very short story of how the buildings were made. So it's an architectural story. So that's really the ov overlapping element to all of these. So Daniel, the first time we met you actually came to Belfield for a fashion shoot, but I think very quickly our conversation moved on to the architecture of the building you were in. We were in Tierney, which of course is the Gem Vehart building. And I think you had almost this moment of wow when you fell in love with the building and then we started conversations about what you wanted to do here on campus. Yeah, exactly. So it was the initial fashion shoot that I did in the Tierney building and the O'Brien Science Centre. And after that, I think I fell in love. I adopted this kind of love affair with the architecture that I encountered. And really then I realised there was so much more work to do by focusing on the specifics of these architectural buildings what I could do if we got the fashion out and we just focused on the architecture in its own self. So when you came on campus, we were in the middle of lockdown, of course, and that meant that there was nobody here. And so how did it feel to you being on an empty campus? Well, I didn't waste any time. As soon as I got that clearance, I got into my car and I sped straight away over here to UCD. And the first building that I photographed was the water tower. I remember it, it was at half 10 in the morning. The sun was shining high, beautiful illumination, deep, dark shadows. And that's when it really set the tone for the whole exhibition and my approach. And then working over the following months, you know, it was, it was a gift in some ways to have this massive amount of time and an empty campus. And also, of course, then we had the sunshine as well, but also gave me a chance to interact with the community as well, the recreational users of the campus, which was something new for me. I didn't realize just the, the reach of the campus in that sense. So even there were some nights where I was photographing till one or two o'clock in the morning and people were walking their dogs and they were stopping me, asking me what I was doing, really engaged, wanting to know and curious. So it's actually a great gift to be able to share this work now with that community again. Some of the buildings, uh, some of the iconic pieces you can recognise, but in a number of your pieces that we have on display, you don't take it as a representation of the building. You zoom in, perhaps, and so I think that's what... Also, there's that interesting interplay between the buildings themselves and then the way you use light on top of that, too. Yeah, absolutely, and I think this is something that I really try to to pay value to in my practice is that I don't go into a space with a predetermined notion of how it should look or how I should represent it. I very much listen to the building and let it guide me through through my lens basically and so sometimes you'll find that it's the the wide angle that works and other times it's the crop and the abstraction that works but a large backbone of my practice is not in documentary photography it's actually more in abstract expressionism and it's through the abstraction that I find my language. And oftentimes I don't believe that it's abstracting, it's seeing, it's a way of seeing things. And you see the interconnected relationship between the buildings. It could be a corner or it could be a, a wall, a concrete wall that aligns to a new modernist building. And it, that's really, it's that space between where you find this relationship that I focused on throughout the work. So the abstraction that you talk about actually creates almost geometric shapes between the materials of the different buildings and how the light strikes onto those buildings. Absolutely. What the light does initially is illuminates the building and the facade and the concrete. And take the water tower, for example. I mean, that photograph is taken from how many meters below on ground and suddenly now visitors are able to see the skin and the flesh of a tower that they would be looking high up into the sky to see. So those, that is really important as well, but also obviously the abstraction as well. How many photographs did you take altogether? Too many, no, so I took 10,000 pictures. 10,000 pictures? Close to 10,000 photographs. Okay. Um, so on various different days. So then some days I would come back to the same site four or five times just because the light changes. And even what happened was I would go to the one site on a Thursday and then Two weeks later, I'd go back to the same site at the same time on a Thursday. And of course, the light had changed, the planet had changed, the sun had changed its angles. So that all influenced then which picture made it to the show. 
and of course you had beautiful weather rather uh, than slightly drizzly day that we have today and that gave you the light as well. It, well that's how I work is under clear blue skies and I think I believe that I cannot create the language that I'm creating or speak the language that I want to speak under cloudy skies and dull lighting. So that was also an aspect of, of time and waiting for those windows of opportunity to shoot under clear blue skies. Because I think even with clouds or, or any type of, of dull lighting, you do not get the building at its best. And I wanted these images to be slightly aspirational. I wanted them to be permanent in the sense that this is a representation of these buildings that I know will last a very, very long time. So I think sometimes I could wait two weeks before I got the proper window to work in. So it is a very time sensitive project too. Tell me about the process that you went through in terms of where you started and how you ended up deciding that it would be black and white. Well, the process was quite an evolution for me in many ways because I'd, originally I had started off wanting to do silkscreen prints over the images so as to convey a relationship between photography and painting. And then as I came on campus more often and as I photographed each building, I really realized that the DNA and the language of each building is what needs to shine through. Without any embellishment, without any colors, without any paint, the image as is. And I think also for that aspect, I relied heavily on Berent and Hilla Becker, who are two fine art photographers. And their photography actually treads into sculpture. So there's a sculptural quality to the imagery as well and if you just focus on the, the texture so the concrete the walls the glass all of these qualities by just photographing them on on their own they really shine through hi my name is ellen rowley and along with my colleague finolo kane i'm one of the editors of making belfield space and place in ucd my name is finola o'kane i also work here in ucd and I'm co-editor with Alan of this book, Making Belfield. So Fanola, um, I'm looking at the book and people have asked us about uh, the cover of the book because it is pretty uh, spectacular. It's a, a lovely cover. And uh, I believe you really were the, the leading force on that along with the designer with UCD Press, um, Daniel Moorhead. And I was wondering if we could talk about how we or you and Daniel came to to that particular cover design? Well, as you know, we were in, in the cover image, we wanted to get the essence of Belfield and the reasons for its move and why people would want to move from the city centre out to a suburban location. And um, so we wanted to express in the cover the colours, the tints and um, the environment of somewhere where, you know, there are lots of trees, lots of sunshine today. Um, the sea, view of the sea. So we're trying to get that into the cover. And at the same time, we were very conscious that we wanted to get the kernel of Weishert's idea, um, that there, there was this walkway of concrete kind of stepped planes and that you, you kind of shiv shifted along this walkway and could get different views um, of different key buildings, particularly the water tower, as you moved along it. Um, so it's trying to get that into the cover. At the same time, we were also thinking of the great um, artists and artworks of the 1960s in Ireland, like Patrick Scott or Louis Le Broque, um, who used a lot of linen and natural tones and gold, Patrick Scott, in, in his work. Um, so we wanted to make a slight reference to the traditions within painting and art that used to be within these buildings or that were commissioned for these buildings um, to reference that in the cover as well. So I'm struck by your discussion of colour and, and by the marked gold on the cover. Um, and also I'm reminded of um, in, in our research how we, we realised that Fehurst himself, when he came to Ireland, having designed this notionally in, in Warsaw, um, how he was struck by the colour palette of the damp greens, the damp soil, the grey sky, but yet this bright light. Um, so is that, is that something that influenced the, the cover? And then also you mention about landscape and in so far as how does our book uh, tackle the, the wider issue of landscape and landscape history? Well I think um, the interest in landscape became evident as we researched um, particularly the impact that campus, American campuses and English campuses had on Michael Tierney and the influence of the Nottingham campus where Geoffrey Jellicoe leading landscape architect worked um, and so that, that landscape impact, which is coming from the States um, and then into Europe, 
um, did influence the competition and particularly its conditions, which, which emphasised the need to retain the parkland, to use the natural environment of Belfield in a positive sense in the design solution. And Weichert responded to that call, I think, very well, um, that the landscape should drive aspects of the project. So, um, so it's not just for, because initially they come to this site for sports, because mm. they're in town, they're in Earlsford Terrace, around the south inner city, and they come in 33, but then, as you say, Michael Tierney sets about a very explicit and clear-headed uh, site acquisition plan mm. through the 1950s. Mm. And it's not just for lungs. These, these are all individual domains and villas. Uh, I think as well, for me, your research into the l landscape history, which we, you know, we, we know a little bit of it, but we probably know them as these individual houses. I mean, we've got this beautiful Belfield house. We've done really interesting things with Merville House, mm. adapting it to Nova. We've hired more, whatever. And they factor in UCD's you know, collective consciousness every day. But what you do is you stitch it together with this, um, this landscape intention that most of us weren't aware was, was there, if you like. Mm. Well, I think one of the key things that Michael Tierney did was actually come and live at Belfield. Ah, um, yeah. Because as any architect would always advise possibly a client, certainly for a house, to actually live on site, to get a feeling for the light, a feeling for the changing tones and colours of the landscape. Um, and I think actually living here translated into his intention for UCD, um, which then he c communicated really quite clearly in the competition. Um, I mean, I don't think it was easy. I think, uh, as you say, th these are all separate villa landscapes with their own rationale. Some were much older than others. Um, some of the oldest would be Robert Castle, for example, where, where originally there was some kind of medieval castle on that site. And then there are the other uh, Marvel, is, is was built for um, Foster, who was the chief Baron Foster. And so, so these are 18th century houses. They have the standard kind of Brownian landscape of tree belts and drives and approaches. Um, so how to keep the best of all these separate designed landscapes and then meld them together into one larger designed landscape, I think was what um, Tierney and Weishert managed to do. In the... Um so I'm, I'm just focusing on your research mm, at the mm. moment and your contribution to the books because there's some really new stuff. You began just to, as a, just a, in terms of an academic curiosity mm. to look at the names of the domains and the sites. Mm. And then that brought us and the book down a really interesting path. And, in, and we, we, you, you wrote this other chapter as well as this landscape chapter, a really fascinating transnational chapter around the name of Belfield. Can you discuss that briefly? Or? Well, there's a small note in the Tierney papers um, on, you know, what name will we give the campus? Like, which villa will we call it after? Because there's, you know, eight or ten, Woodbrook, Merville, Roebuck, many Roebucks. Eleven in full, isn't and there? Eleven in yeah, full. Yeah. So what, what name will we call it? And yeah. so there was a moment of, of indecision and then they fixed on Belfield. Um, and then I was doing other research into the history of the Latouche family who, who lived, they didn't build Belfield, but they lived in Belfield um, and they also sold Belfield. And, and that is the period when it acquired its name. So then right. by further digging and also using the wonderful map resources, which are now available online, um, there is a map in the Library of Congress of the sale of Belfield plantation in Jamaica as part together with Cape Clear and Coningsburg plantation. Um, so the Latouche family, um, like many um, families of the 18th century who were wealthy, were also drawing substantial income from the Caribbean and from slave plantations. Nice. Um, so this link between this Belfield plantation in Jamaica and Belfield in Dublin became apparent. And it's also very apparent in one of the maps in the book, which is now in the Library of Congress, very carefully um, curated and um, organised within the Library of Congress, which makes very clear just how much of this part of Dublin, Dublin 4, this very wealthy southern suburbia, is indebted to the, that transmission of, of um, money always coming from the Caribbean. And then when you start to dig a little deeper, you see that many suburban families in this part of Dublin did owe some of their income, not all of their income, um, to the steady stream of income which was coming um, from the plantations in the Caribbean. And, and then even after emancipation, um, when uh, our, the slaves begin to farm the land, but there's still 
you know, sending rents then to Dublin. So that's partly why we enjoy such a wonderful environment in South County Dublin um, and why the landscape is so beautiful is that it's been a wealthy suburbia for a very long time and we are indebted to other parts of the world for its beauty. I think, I think that point um, and what our book we, we've tried mm. to do in a small way is to highlight this relationship always between the kind of the hyper local, the everyday that we walk around here in Belfield and then this global question. And I think what was interesting in, in, uh, in how we were going about things was to, to reposition Belfield within its international context um, and to uncover through an analysis, a close analysis of the competition. Uh, first of all, the, the very great international aspiration of UCD mm. by the end of the 50s, their frustration at not having the right equipment, the right environment to carry out international standard research. Um, so as a result, their ambition was not to be curbed, so it was to be an international mm. competition. And then all the different uh, countries, the architects from all over the world who submitted, well, they submitted from over 20 countries. Some, I've read 40, but actually I think we should be more conservative. Um, but in the, the kind of the four uh, designs that were premiated, first, second, mm. third, fourth, first is this very young Polish person, basically has, is unbuilt at this point, Andrzej Wehert. Second is, a, is a, an, an American firm. Third is a consortium of several architects from former Czechoslovakia. And then fourth are two really young Dublin guys, um, Sam Stevenson and Arthur Gibney. So the, there's only one Irish design and there, there are no British uh, mm. that, are, that are premiated. But we were really interested in trying to understand a little bit more about the ambition of that. We discovered in our research that the two really important figures from Team 10, mm. that post-war kind of a, uh, association, if you like, of architects uh, put in mm. designs, Giancarlo De Carlo, the Italian, and Shadrach Woods, who had actually studied philosophy in Trinity, um, and had just won the Free University of Berlin competition mm. at the sa on the same year, 1963. So in our book, we talk about all of that, and then we also asked, invited our colleague Kathleen James Chakraborty to set Belfield in an international context. So she discusses Germany, American campuses and Britain primarily. Mm. But we weren't disinterested in what was happening at home too. And I think you mentioned it as well, how the, the argument and the discussion to come out of town, and it was a real loss of memory and place to leave mm. town, to leave the city centre. And there was a lot of opposition. So we were looking at that and we were reading the commission of the accommodation for the NUI from 1952, which was an amazingly rich document and showed that they were going all over Scandinavian, Nordic countries and, and all over Britain and taking examples from there. We also invited Joseph Brady, mm. the, culture, uh, the historical and cultural geographer, to talk about this kind of general move in, in Irish society towards a kind of a suburban turn. Yes, well, I, I think it is very interesting um, the suburban turn and the attraction it holds for Irish people and, and also the attraction, I suppose, of the campus as a concept in Ireland, um, partly because it, it, it does originate in the United States. It does originate in the plans of old American universities um, to, to use the landscape as a kind of educational force for their students. Um, and also that the corners of the quadrangles in American universities are always open to the town or open to other perspectives. So I think given the period of the 1950s in Ireland, the very recent independence of the state, that it was a, a national project to have a suburban campus because it was thought to be more defining for this country as, as a third level kind of environment than maybe the older quadrangle plans um, that were common certainly in Great Britain but also on mainland Europe. So Ellen, it, UCD has a great number of buildings um, and it acquires more all the time. So, so how did you choose the case studies? Which buildings um, would warrant a case study? Um, it was, it's, a, it's a real challenge trying to figure out what to include because UCD Belfield has some really interesting object buildings and really important infrastructure. So we, we couldn't come at it from the perspective of, you know, which, which building produces the most interesting research or is most important academically, you know, or the largest or whatever. So we decided, um, I certainly decided to apply my training as an architectural historian by looking at what buildings have been uh, the most acclaimed critically nationally and internationally in, in architecture 
architectural terms, in design terms, and making a difference, making a contribution. And I was also mindful, as were you, that we were writing this book and putting it together for the wider UCD com community who, who may or may not have, have a sense of, of the design excellence of the campus, and so to share the fact that some of these buildings are critically acclaimed. And especially in the later, uh, in the later selection, um, those post 2000s, we were keen to show the work of alumni, which is really widely recognised um, outside of Ireland and, and indeed in Ireland, such as the, the very diminutive um, uh, Urban Institute by Grafton Architects um, from 2002, and similarly the extension to the, vir uh, the National Virus Lab by McCull by McCullough Mulvan from 2003. Um, and then we finished off with this very recent and pretty spectacular building by Robin Lee Architecture for the Confucius Institute of Ireland, which has just recently won um, a Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland um, medal. And what is interesting and that we wanted to get clear is that um, two of the older original buildings, that is the restaurant building by Robin Walker from Scott Tallon Walker and the Tyranny building, the administration building where we are now by Andre Vehert, they both won the gold medal for design excellence at the time, 1970 for the restaurant and 72 for this building. And that those facts are actually forgotten or maybe not known by the UCD community. And we really wanted to celebrate that. Thank you to Finola and Ellen, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for the launch of Belfield 50. And we look forward to welcoming you on campus to visit the timeline and the photographic exhibition over the coming weeks.